Hi, and welcome to a special iOS programming tutorial. And today, rather than covering a specific aspect of Objective-C and iPhone and iPad app development, I'm going to be giving you a preview or showing you the brand new Xcode that Apple just released to the public a couple of days ago, Xcode 5, which now supports iOS 7 SDKs. So I'm going to be showing you how you can get your hands on Xcode 5, what you can do with Xcode 5 and how to use some of its brand new functionality, how it compares to Xcode 4.6.3, and how to make your iOS 7 apps work with iOS 6 and the other way around. So, let's get started. I'll begin by showing you how you can get Xcode 5 if you haven't already downloaded it. If you have, you can skip ahead this in this video just a few minutes. So, first thing you'll need to do is go into the App Store. I've already got mine open. The first place you'll want to go is in the top menu, select Updates. This will only work if you've already got Xcode 4.6.3 installed, which is the Xcode that we've been using throughout these tutorials. It's this one, the one that starts up looking like this. If you do have this Xcode or any other Xcode installed, then you'll see when you go into the App Store and click on the Updates tab, both OS X updates as well as Xcode updates. You'll need to update Xcode. Some of the great new features include Preview Assistant, which allows you to see what your iOS 7 app would look like in iOS 6 and vice versa, SDKs for iOS 7, so that you can develop iOS 7 applications using all the native new controls, and new auto layout and debug gauges, which are actually very useful. If you haven't already got Xcode installed, thus you can't update it, just search for Xcode in the search area. It's the first one that appears under the category of developer tools and has a little blue thing with the hammer through it. If you click on it now, you'll be able to click uh, free, I think it's called, and then just click download. It's about a one gigabyte download, so allow maybe 20 minutes to download the application. You'll notice there's a brand new startup screen, brand new XIBs and storyboards, and a whole lot of brand new stuff, and a whole new layout. And it's the first major update to Xcode since Xcode 3, which was released with iOS 3 a few years back. So it's been a long time coming and much anticipated. So let's now open up Xcode 5 once you've downloaded it, and I'll start showing you some of the great new features of it. You'll notice the first thing is that even if you haven't used Xcode 5 before, all your applications, all your recent applications that you've developed are still in the recents area, but there's a bit of a new interface here. I'll open up Xcode 4.6.3, and you can see some of the f first noticeable differences are the layout, but also the fact that now you only have the option to create a new Xcode project, or check out something existing by connecting to a repository. You no longer have a link to the Apple Developer Portal, or Xcode documentation links, as that's all available within the application. The other thing you'll notice is that until you hover over it, they show you this window when Xcode launches. Checkbox isn't there, so if you don't want it to show every time, just unselect that. But I do, so I'll leave it there. I'm going to click on Create a New Xcode Project to begin creating a new Xcode project in Xcode 5. So you'll immediately notice a whole lot of differences. First thing is Sprite Kit, which is a brand new option. You've got new icons uh, representing each of these options, a much thinner status bar and different status menu, different layout really, and it's just very different. Well, I'll just show you a tabbed application. Tabbed application is interesting in that you get to see the new tab bars which are transparent, otherwise I do a single view. Let's compare this to what the options are in Xcode 4.6.3. You'll notice they both have Master Detail, then OpenGL, then Page Based, Single View, Tabbed, Utility, Empty, and as I said, the only difference is Sprite Kit. So I'm going to select Tabbed Application, but you can select anything. I, select, I suggest that if you want to start experimenting with iOS 7 and Xcode 5, you start with a Tabbed or Single View, and once you're used to it a bit, then you can start creating some applications. So once you click next, you'll notice a big difference, which is you no longer have the option to select to use Arc to include unit tests and whether or not you want to use storyboards. By default, all iOS 7 and Xcode 5 projects use storyboards, not XIBs. So it's worth getting used to using a storyboard if you have been using XIBs. And I've covered this in tutorials 1 and 2 if you're not already familiar with them. The reason that you including unit tests is gone is that it's kind of redundant and it wasn't really ever necessary. And the reason that Arc is gone is that now all applications must support Arc. 
if you're using Xcode 5 and iOS 7. And it's fairly easy to upgrade your projects to Arc. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. It's pretty much just if you're used to developing in older versions of Xcode, you might remember having to go alert release and release various things and use the keyword release a lot. And essentially, if you want to upgrade to Arc, you'll just get a whole lot of errors on those lines that say release. You just delete that line and then it should work well. So I'll just call this RS7 Xcode 5 Preview. Uh, I'll, other than that, all the options are the same in your company identifier and organization name, and all of that should have been transferred to Xcode 5 when you upgraded from Xcode 4, and if you didn't upgrade, you just type that in. If you haven't upgraded, I suggest watching our first programming tutorial and introduction to Xcode. Um, although it's a bit different because it's Xcode 4.6.3, the actual controls and setup are fairly similar. Now, another difference when you start to click create is that it automatically selects for you create git repository on my Mac or you can add to new server and then enter a server address. Now I don't want to create a git repository but if you did then that's how you would do that. And I'll cover git repositories and what they are in another tutorial. Essentially they're a way of managing versions of your projects uh, in the cloud. So anyway I've created my project now and you'll notice there's a huge difference in that initial summary window. You'll see that there's firstly matching code identity warnings here. Everything is centered, it's all white, there's no glossy lines. It's very clean and it's very different. So let me go through a bit of the differences here. So the identity uh, stuff is all pretty much the same, the versions and everything. And then you've got the deployment. So you can set the deployment target to be anything from 7 down to 6, but you can't do anything under 6. So if you want to develop something for iOS 5, what happens is you develop your iOS 7 application and anyone with it and you can set the deployment target to 6 and anyone with a device running iOS 4 or 5 will just uh, automatically when they download your application get an older version and it's something which has been complained about a lot and might change in the near future. We've then got our devices and I've just selected iPhone and our main interface which is called main uh, it's no longer called main storyboard dot storyboard again because main storyboard dot storyboard is kind of redundant to have storyboard it's now just main dot storyboard so that's the new name by default for storyboards if you were wondering device orientation as always is not selected to be upside down for iPhone you'll notice rather than having icons representing each of these options they just check boxes our status bar style um, with iOS 7 it can only be default but if you've selected a deployment target of iOS 6 um, as your lowest target or 6.1 or 6.1.2 or anything like that then it is still possible to do black translucent and black opaque but if you're just developing for iOS 7 it won't make any difference what status bar style you select. Um, another difference which I'll I'm about to show you is your asset inspector, I think it's called um, asset viewer. So rather than having all your app icons and launch images, uh, dragging them into this area in the summary window, you now go into this asset uh, inspector and drag them all in there and you can control all your assets and retina and non-retina images. So it's much, uh, it's managed a lot better. We've also got our linked frameworks and libraries here, as they always are, and we can add them straight from the project summary just by clicking add and we get all the brand new iOS 7 frameworks as well as all the old ones that you're already familiar with. So let's imagine now that I want to add an app icon. I might cover this quickly in another basic programming and Xcode tutorial but quickly I'll show you now. You just click on uh, source app icon uh, asset catalogs that's what they're called app icon and you could select don't use uh, catalogs if you select don't use catalogs, all you need to do is get your image by right clicking on the summary, clicking add files, uh, which is here, and then you know, finding your file to add. And then clicking copy items into destinations group folder if needed, and then clicking add. But uh, if you uh, do want to use an asset catalog, I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Anyway, once you've imported your image, then you just drag it in as you usually would have. Or just click on this folder icon and find the image. But let's use an asset catalog. So migrate app icons into an asset catalog will now appear because I've uh, gone from not using an asset catalog to using one. So I'll migrate this. And what that means is it will pretty much transfer all of these images into an asset catalog. 
So an asset catalog, as I said, is just a way of managing all of your images. So, you, for example, with our icons, there's about 10 different sizes that you need. You need one for the home screen, a retina home screen, an iPad, iPad mini, which doesn't have retina, obviously. You need one for everything, pretty much. And the one thing to note is that with iOS 7, the only non-retina device that is still supported is the iPad 2 and iPad mini. So by iOS 8, you won't, you won't have to bother with retina and non-retina images, because all devices will use retina. But for now, you still do. So if I click on this arrow, it'll take me to my asset catalog. As you can see, I've got a two times for the iPhone Spotlight, two times for this, two times for this, and I can click Show Slicing or Show Overview. Uh, if I try dragging an image into times two that doesn't fit that size, then obviously it won't work. And I can see all of my assets and my asset catalogs along this preview here. If I click on image.x assets, that's how I navigate to this window, and you can see here. So once I've got my images imported, they'll show up down the side here, and all I need to do is drag them into the corresponding, um, into the corresponding, um, I guess you could call it frame, where it should go. And then Apple, uh, well, Xcode will automatically put the 29 pixel one in your spotlight settings search, and 40 pixel point for your iOS 7, and 60 for, uh, iPhone, uh, icon on your home screen, and all of that for you automatically. So, the asset catalog is a brand new way of managing your images uh, in particular. So, let's now go to the main storyboard, dot storyboard, which is one of the biggest changes to Xcode so far, and it pretty much just because you get all these new iOS 7 controls. So, I'm going to drag up my controls a bit so you can see them more easily. Now, you'll notice they're all pretty much the same, except for one which you probably haven't noticed at first, until you look at the first and second tabs. Now, in iOS 6, they probably had a title and then some text. Now, there's a title and something called a UI text view. So, a UI text view is pretty much a text field. But, in iOS 7, there's no longer such thing as a text field. Just a text view, and I can zoom in and you can see what that would look like. So, again, it's just scrollable text. But, I don't know why Apple's done it, but now you can't preview it in the storyboard. So, uh, if you can see here, my text is selected to be loaded by the first view and everything. I can't see that in the storyboard, but if I were to run the application, that text would display in this area. It's sort of like adding in a web view, which you'll notice you don't actually see the web page until you run the application. So, although they look the sa it's the same icon in your assets, if I drag in a text field, it now appears as a UI text view, and I can't actually preview the text. It's a bit annoying, and it's a bit uh, unusual that Apple would do this for no apparent reason, but they have. So, let me start at the very basic controls, which are labels, buttons, and segmented controls, pretty much. Labels are very similar, just a slightly updated system font, uh, which is slightly nicer, slightly thinner and narrowing, just looks more iOS 70. The buttons are a big different, uh, different and you'll notice that they uh, don't have any borders or any glossiness or anything they're pretty much just labels, but in bold and with a different color. And Apple likes you to use a different color for your buttons, which is by default blue. And that's how users identify them as a button rather than a label. And again, I can just adjust fonts and everything in this area here. You'll notice that the default text color is also a lighter blue rather than the darker, more sort of stingy blue that they had in iOS 6. And uh, segmented controls are very different. And although... Um, there are many issues, actually, with the storyboards and previews that people have been having. Uh, segmented controls are one of them. It refuses to preview one of them being selected. Although, if I did run my application now, because I've selected segmented segment 0 as selected, it would actually be selected when I ran my application. Don't worry if you don't know what that means, but just sort of watch and enjoy looking at the new segmented controls. You'll also notice that now, because they're all these... Uh, bar button segmented controls. The style plain, bordered, and bar appear to make no difference, but they do. Let me now show you a preview in iOS 6. To do this, I don't need to have an iOS 7 and iOS 6 simulator running side by side or anything. All I need to do is go into the little tuxedo icon, the assistant editor. If I click on that now, you'll see it's taken me to automatic. But so I've got my storyboard on one side and my code on the other. But where it says automatic up here, click on that, scroll down to previews, 
and then where it says previews, hover over it, and then click on main dot storyboard preview. Now it's just showing me a preview in iOS 7 again, so that's kind of useless. But if I look to the bottom, you can see it says iOS 7 and later. If I click on that and then click iOS 6.1 and earlier, I can now see the iOS 6 preview. And I can use this button here to toggle between a 4 inch iPhone and a 3.5 inch iPhone. So this is what the app would look like in iOS 6. And that's why I said before that the status bar might make a difference. Because although they all look like this in iOS 7, in iOS 6 it will look different. You'll notice that the labels have similar fonts, but again, you can see the old um, iOS 6 button. To fix this in the iOS 7 preview, I'll click on my button and change the type to custom. Now it's going to a white text color, so I'll go back to a blue. So select other, and then I'll select a blue. Now that both buttons look the same, because they're both custom buttons. So that's one thing that you'll need to do. The second thing you'll notice is that although there's no way of getting a really nice looking segmenting control into iOS 6 without adding code, what you probably do want is for them to be of the same height, or approximately the same height, rather than having this thin iOS 7 segmented control and a thick iOS 6 and below segmented control. So I'll just click on my segmented control, change the style to bar, and although that does nothing to the iOS 7 application, it will add a bar segmented control to iOS 6 which is a lot thinner, so it's much more proportionate. Again, I then need to customize the tab bar, really, because there's no other way of easily changing this tab bar um, and then so as to change the iOS 6 tab bar. But I'll cover each element individually in later tutorials. Again, if I had a switch, by default in iOS 7, it's green, and in iOS 6, it's blue. So I'm going to change the on tint to this blue that we use for the button, and now that'll change for the button. Uh, for the switch in iOS 6. If I change it to a bright yellow, it'll change it in both of them to the bright yellow. Um, in iOS, in the preview in the storyboard, there's this odd sort of shadow to both the switch and the slider in the iOS 7 preview. If I ran the application now, which I'll do for you in a moment, that actually isn't there. It's just an, a little glitch in the Xcode 5 software. I can also now change the thumb, thumb tint in both of them, but it doesn't look so good in iOS 6, so I don't recommend that you do that. Unfortunately, the switches are of different sizes. In iOS 6, it's a bit thinner and a lot wider. In iOS 7, it's a bit fatter and squashed together. There's no sort of type of switch that is thin like there was with segmented controls, so you sort of just have to work around that and leave a bit of room above, uh, below, and to the right and left of a switch, so as the, so there is nothing obstructing its way in iOS uh, 6 or iOS 7 if you designed it for whatever one you designed it for. Um, sliders, they look pretty much the same, but they have a much bigger thumb tint and a much thinner track, uh, or a much thinner, yeah, well, track. Uh, you can see the difference here. Again, the, you just need to leave a bit of room around that big thumb track, which is that thing that you press on to slide the slider, so that in iOS 6, if it looks fine in iOS 6, and I had a button a bit higher up, you'll notice that it still looks fine in iOS 6, but in iOS 7 it's now covering the button, uh, sorry, the slider, so you do need to be careful about that and leaving a bit of room around elements that are of different sizes. Again, I can change the minimum track tint and everything, and that's all the same. Then the progress bar is pretty much a slider without the thumb track, and the step has changed a bit. It's now looking a lot more like the segment control which uh, in iOS 6 it looked a lot like an iOS 6 segmented control when it was in its bar state uh, by default it is so that's a lot easier just to drag it in and you don't even have to customize a switch or a stepper sorry really there's a whole lot of other new controls like a brand new date picker which you can't actually preview anymore in the beta version of Xcode 5 they did have a preview for the date picker and text view that's a new thing that's really just been released with the public release but you can play around with all of that yourself. I'll also just drag in a new um, title bar, and I'm going to change the bar tint to a white rather than this sort of cream color that it is by default. Um, it's a lot better again, and there's a lot of nice new differences and changes to the bar so that there's no glossy look anymore, no matter what color it is. So I could make it this reddish pink, and again, it's just a flat color with a little bit of a shadow, and it's actually partially transparent. 
So if I could, uh, so I could have a web view behind it, and I could actually see a bit of the web view. And you can do that using masks and a whole lot of other different things, which I'll show you in later tutorials. And again, you'll notice the preview in RS6 has got that older look. Now, the only thing to note is that I need to change the style to black, and then make it maybe white color bef before it appearing in the RS6 preview. I'm going to go back to default so I can see the title. Even then, the preview is not actually working for the title bar. Hopefully, that's something Apple will fix up because you can't accurately preview um, toolbars and title bars. So that's all I'm going to drag into my view for now. The other thing you'll notice is the buttons are a toolbar button or bar button item that's changed, and they've got a few new identifiers. So if I were to go identifier and then uh, ca <coughs> camera, for example. It looks a bit different in iOS 6 to it does in iOS 7. Anyway, I'm going to run the application now so you can see the new simulator and you can see what the application looks like. So, uh, again, in the iOS simulator, if you click on that, you've got all the standard options except that now you can change by running through Xcode before you only have the option of iPhone or iPad. And then from the simulator menu, you could, you could select hardware and the type of hardware. So, Retina or non-retina, 4 inch or 3.5 inch, and all of that. Now, you can test each of them just by clicking run from in Xcode. And you'll notice there's a new option, iPhone Retina 4 inch 64 bit. That's because the iPhone 5S, which has just been announced and is being released tomorrow actually, is 64 bit. Now, unless you're making a really advanced game, don't really worry about what that means because it won't make any difference to you. Anyway, I'm going to run from my 4 inch uh, iPhone 5 device. And I'm going to click run and wait for it to load and load up the simulator. Once the simulator is loaded, simulator has loaded, you'll notice that it's an iOS 7 simulator. And you can see our application, which we've just designed. You can see nice fades on the button when you click on them, and even a fade on the segmented control. As you can see, the stepper, the switch, and all our different controls working. And as I mentioned, although there's a shadow in iOS um, 7 preview in the storyboard, there's not actually one on the switch on the real device. So you don't need to worry about little glitches like that. Also, you can see that the text view actually shows up in the simulator rather than just having this placeholder blue box. So that's another good thing about um, the simulator and testing it in real life. I can obviously access notification center and control center and use this as an iOS 7 device, which it is. I get the iOS 7 settings application and as a great new bonus, which I'm really happy with, because often you do need to test it as a developer, and it's worth being able to test it on the simulator before running on the device, you now have a calendar application built into the simulator. Um, although I don't really like the iOS 7 calendar application, because you don't get a preview. But that's another story. You get all the normal iOS 7 applications, like Safari, with the cool new tabs. And everything else runs on iOS 7, as it would on a real iOS 7 device. So if for some reason you've decided to keep your devices as iOS 6 devices so that you can still test iOS 6 efficiently, then uh, you can still test in the simulator iOS 7 compatibility, even the new keyboards and everything like that. Uh, the one thing you'll have to do though if you do want to test on iOS 6 is go Window Organizer, and that's different as well because there used to be an Organizer button here in the top right corner of Xcode. Now you got to go Window Organizer, and then you've got to go into, um, can't remember exactly, oh no, sorry, you've got to go into Xcode, Preferences, and then Downloads, and then download iOS 6 simulators and iOS 5 simulators. And you can also download other documentation and everything. So to do that, you just go, as I said, Xcode, Preferences, which is Command, Comma, and then go into the Downloads tab, and download the iOS 6 and 5, it's worth doing, simulators. Oh, iOS 6.1 is actually probably a better simulator to get. And then you can test on both simulators. Although it's worth noting that you can't have both simulators running at the same time. That doesn't really matter. And I'll cover all of this in more detail another time. The actual code looks very similar. And it runs in a very similar way. You'll notice that there's no line numbers. And that's just because I haven't set up line numbers on my Xcode 5 yet. Because I only just downloaded the final copy and updated mine. So don't worry about that. There's a whole lot more I could show you like source control, which is really Git repositories. I won't show you that. The one thing I will show you, though, is I'll stop this build, run it, and then I'll quickly show you some of the basic debugging tools that you have. 
so you'll notice all the different tabs that I have. And there's one new one. It's this one. The one with a line, three lines, and then another line. Now, if I go back to the simulator, what you can see here is it's showing me the memory usage of my application, which has been pretty steady, and the CPU usage. As I have scroll and scroll, it still stays pretty much the same. Let's see what happens if I open a new tab. Okay, so still nothing much. It did work, go up a bit, and the CPU usage went up a bit too. If I had a more advanced application, you notice here that maybe as I change views, and I've had this happen before, I would change the view, the memory went up a bit, and then it went back down. And then as I, as when I went, clicked on the back button, I opened the view, went back up, and then it went back down to what it should be. But then I had another application where I'd open a view, and it would go up. The, the memory would spike. It would go up a bit. And then I'd click the back button, it would go up even more and more and more. And I had to do some debugging to find what the problem was. So this is actually really useful for getting an app that works really well. And you can see that this is using quite a bit of memory for an application that isn't doing very much. And in a later tutorial, I'll show you how to understand what this means and how to fix up any issues when you see what your CPU and memory usage is like. So that's a really great feature though for advanced debugging, which it's good to do when you're actually distributing your applications on the App Store. So that's all I've got time for now. There's not much else to really show you for now that I won't go into in more detail later on, other than the Capabilities tab, which just allows you to very easily turn on things like background mode, so I might want to have audio playing in the background, and things like that. Before, you would have had to go into your info.plist, and you would have had to add required background modes and then audio here. Um, but now I can just, with the switch of a switch, uh, I'll just drop down this menu by clicking on this arrow. I might want it to do location updates in the background and other um, things like that, which make it very, very easy to run things in the background. Other things that are new in iOS 7 is interrupt audio, which allows you to get audio from other applications. So say there's a music app on my phone, and I'm, I'm creating a new application that uh, shows an advertisement related to that music. I could find out what the current audio playing is using Interrap Audio and getting audio from other running applications. There's also other things like data protection and maps within applications and things like that. So, um, maps is also good because it automatically turns on the map framework or mapkit.framework. And you'll notice that it's automatically added that framework. And there's a few other ones like Passbook that will automatically add the Passkit framework and all of that and iCloud, which is another really great one actually. Um, and you can now add your Apple ID within Xcode, and you can add multiple accounts, which is fantastic for people who develop applications for other people, because you can have, like, a whole lot of clients, Apple IDs, all in the one Xcode, without having to log in and log out all the time. Anyway, that's all I've got time to show you now. If you do have any questions about using Xcode 5, or any tutorial requests related to updates in Xcode 5, or updating current tutorials, to Xcode 5, let me know by messaging us directly through YouTube, commenting on this video, visiting our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com forward slash 99 cents app development, or our website, 99 cents app development.com. All the links are in the description. And uh, if you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time for another regular programming tutorial. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.